Yeah, it was supposed to be out there. You were supposed to leave uh, Saturday. Looks like the sound is echoing. This week again, she went without me. She took one of her friends. Yeah, I'm flying out Thursday night. Meeting her in the my grandma and to her. So I'll be there Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Friends, like, like, she's having a baby on Saturday. So we would just go out and have a woodwork meeting. Oh, it's house project. You guys, we've been listening. I did a work on a bowl. At that time, WoW was already out, but you could still play it. Yeah, worked on this bowl. It was like that, like, original Warcraft stuff. Yeah, hours. I don't know. 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 I don't Yes, cool. Well, it's a wood, no water, yeah, but it's the same basic yeah. concept. Yeah. Wood, yeah. no water. Okay, so you don't let you do that with sprinkle. Mm -hmm. And but you do not have water in the system. Right. As, as I'm right. You can add it in if you want to. You can add it in so that you have a constant yeah. charm on it. I but but that. I yeah. probably don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. No, because if you do that with soil, it actually needs to be malleable. So it's hard to get a consistent charge on with the, yeah, with the gem, it, that's nice. a problem. Like, Cracking crack crack it, yeah. yeah. So it's cool. Yeah. 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 After all the hours, I think she's had everything that's This is before I went bad in the earth, before I take out another chunk of metal. I glued it, I might use some epoxy in the cracks. Like it'll turn it's out hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I like a putty. 10 o'clock, I see a quorum. If everybody's good, let's go ahead and call the order. Do a roll call. Friday, uh, Chair Rogers. Here. Councilmember Alvarez. Present. Looks like Council Member Okrepke is not here, so let the record reflect that all Council Members are present except for Okrepke. Yep. Okrepke is at the happiest place in the world unless you're a parent chasing around their children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Overall participation today. Uh, do we have any modifications to the agenda? No modifications to the agenda, Chair. Any announcements? We do have some announcements. Um, our planning and economic development director, Gabe Osborne, is going to handle that. Hello, Ashley. <laughs> Hello. Sorry, I'm a little late. I was told there was no quorum, but I thought I better come check. What? <laughs> what? Have a quorum. <laughs> there you are. We just established the quorum, so we're good. Let's do this. We're good. We're good. All right. Good morning, board. Uh, just a really quick announcement. Um, in addition to Scott, we have some echo. I'll let Jack take care of it. We're good. He's got it covered. Um, in addition to filling Scott's position and Marin's position, the Arts Trophy Coordinator position, um, excuse me, responsibilities, um, we are now finalizing the team to fill of our admin analyst position. Um, so that recruitment went out. We had a successful interview process and we altered that. Uh, so you'll see another team member here in the near future, and that really rounds out the economic development team. So it's, it's going to be full go here in the very near future. Um, uh, our hope is that position helps out a lot of the data gathering, program development, a lot of the, the nuts and bolts of what the team is really going to be. Uh, be an instrumental in number two. So Scott is the number one in that role. Um, so really looking forward to filling that. Excellent. Any other announcements? Uh, no other announcements, Chair. I think we can go right into the approval of the minutes. So let's really fast. Let's see if there's any public comment on the announcements. Very good. Cool. All right. Let's go to approval for the minutes. We have any amendments to the no September 10th? None. All right. Let's check with the public. Any comments? Great. We'll show those adopted as presented. Let's move to public comment for non agenda items. Uh, anything within the scope of the Economic Development Committee is fair game. <laughs> I just uh, hope maybe we could say something today about how you're measuring. Economic development. What are the what are your indicators? I think we will. That is on the agenda. Right. Oh, good. Yep. 
All right, let's go ahead and go into new business then. Uh, Scott, uh, are, are you handling 6.1? Yeah, Chair, I'm going to lead us through the new business items and um, I'm going to go ahead and put our PowerPoint presentation, our slide deck on the screen here. I think I just want to share that. And we'll, we'll stop in each little category and check with public comment as we go. Ah, there we go. Yeah, I think you're uh, lagging just a minute. Perfect. Um, um, hello, board. Good morning. Scott Adair, Chief Economic Development Officer for the City of Santa Rosa. And I'll be leading us through the discussion and information items on the agenda, the new business items. I believe that my last or my first presentation to this body, I was three, four days on the job. Uh, so a lot of what we're gonna be discussing today is what the economic development team and division has been up to uh, over the last month and the direction that we're moving forward in. And that, is going to be embodied predominantly in the economic development strategic plan implementation plan. Um, and just to mention a few things about that plan, as you're aware, your council adopted the economic development strategy in April of 2004. The economic development strategy uh, was somewhat genius in its simplicity. Uh, if you strip away a lot of the marketing materials from that strategy, it's really a three, four page plan. Uh, but it does require some robust planning documentation around that. And so the economic development team, we've been working on the implementation plan itself. The implementation plan, what that does is it lays out the specific action steps for each of the goals and strategies that are listed in the city council adopted economic development strategy. That plan is approaching approximately 40 pages in length. It is going through an internal review process. It's not available for review yet. We're waiting for some final departmental review and approval, but our objective is to bring it to you at the next meeting so that you can review it, weigh in on any feedback or provide any insight that you might have. What I can mention about the plan, and it's hard to see on the screen here, that the plan will have a general purpose statement it will have a general overview of the council adopted economic development strategic plan. It will contrast that plan to where there is overlap with the council work plan because there are economic strategies listed in both the council work plan and in the economic development strategic plan adopted by council. Uh, it will lay out what the strategies are, or the actual implementation steps will be for all of those economic development goals in the economic development strategy and the council work plan for those items which are related to economic development. It will lay out what the collaboration and reporting structure will be for the plan. And it will also lay out the budget. And there's one more there and what the plan resources are. This will become essentially our operating guide over the next three to five years as we seek to implement council's economic development strategies. <laughs> it's important to note, however, and this is listed in the draft purpose statement, which is on the screen before you, uh, that this plan is intentionally designed to be malleable. Uh, we want to ensure that the implementation plan itself uh, can be adaptable and flexible so that if economic conditions change, we can pivot. And so that's what we're building into the implementation plan. And as far as building resiliency and plans that can pivot and adapt, I think we really learned that from COVID, from the pandemic. And so that's how we're developing this particular document. So when that document is ready, uh, again, as I said, we'll bring it to you, but that's what one thing, major thing that we've been working on over the last 30 days is putting that plan together and collecting insight from all the team members, all the economic development staff, uh, other leadership within the planning economic development uh, department as well. Is there anything you want to add on to that? Uh, no, I think as Scott mentioned, uh, just the importance of that document being flexible. Um, and we will have to maneuver through this journey and that document basically sets the groundwork for doing that. Um, in addition, when we brought the, uh, the economic development strap plan forward, there was a discussion about providing updates to the full council. Um, we will be looking at doing that on a quarterly basis as we go through this. Um, but having this board chime in on 
the detailed elements of that plan over the next six months that are critical. We really appreciate that feedback. Um, so our game plan is really next meeting to have that finalized and be able to present that to the public, um, at least to gain input from the board. Right. And the only other things that I could add to that would be as part of this, um, we're also looking at an update to the art strategic plan. There's an art strategic plan as well, which is also going to be sunsetting. And so as art and culture is very lateral and adjacent to economic development, uh, we're currently looking or reviewing what those updates to that plan need to be as well. And then with this, developing some policy, um, or I shouldn't say policy, but some procedures and protocol for the economic development division. <laughs> Uh, because our procedures and our protocol for the team, the team members, including our individual work plans, need to align with the implementation plan. And so those are things that we've been working on since our last meeting to you and presentation, and um, looking forward to when we can share it and collect any insights that you might have. Uh, so that's the general update on the economic um, development implementation plan. So I can turn it back over to you, Chair, for any uh, discussion or public comment. Thank you very much, Silva. I appreciate that we're actually looking at, at the future three to five years. And um, I believe one of the questions from public comment were how to use metrics in engaging whether we need to pivot or not. And I'm hoping that in that in that strategic plan, there is a way for us to measure success and failure, or at least being able to, to revamp our, 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 our strategies. Yeah, I think the only thing that's really on my mind also with the plan is how do we benchmark against other locations, right? Like you've got broader economic activity that we're not really going to be able to influence things like inflation. For instance, Santa Rosa is not going to be able to influence international inflation, but being able to benchmark how much of our efforts either bolstering our local economic activity when others are seeing a reduction or uh, are those strategies just not having a moving the needle at all in the conversation. Uh, I don't know how you do that, but I think it's something to be very cognizant of as we expect uh, economic conditions to change over the next three to five years. And Chair, if I may. Yeah. You know, although this might be better served in 6.2, we speak about retention, but it, it, you know, we spend so much effort on uh, getting new business for our city. And I'm wondering what policy changes we must do or face in order to retain the business that we already have. I'm hoping that that also is, is a talking point within the program. And again, I, I see this better serving to call it but I do see the relevancy of it. Let's go to public comment. I'm gonna wait a little bit longer. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. So, um, uh, you know, just the idea of a flexible plan, we see that so it makes sense intuitively, but how does that actually <laughs> work? Suppose there's an issue and then it becomes, should we stick to the plan or should we just be flexible and do something else? How do you decide that? I think so, that would you like me to take yeah, yeah, go for um, questions? Uh, so, yeah, through, through the chair, you're good. Okay, all right. So through the chair, in response to um, the public comment, uh, this will be decided if there is a need to pivot or adapt the plan. It will be specific to the challenge or the barrier that arises. Uh, so I don't see this as being just a generalized, we're going to move in a complete different direction on the plan because there's been some sort of change in the economy locally. We would look at what that change was, what the actual measurable impacts are of that change, how that change relates to the action items in the plan, can the plan remain in effect as it is, as written and adopted, or because of that change, does it need to be modified or tweaked? And then we would go through a public process and we would seek input. We would seek input from community, from our economic development board and commission, and also possibly from city council as well as we'll be taking these regular reports to city council on a quarterly basis. So it would be not done on a whim, uh, but it would be very strategic. And it doesn't necessarily guarantee that just because an economic condition has arisen, that it will create or result in a plan change. All right, let's go on to 6.2 then. Okay. Um, so, Chair, for 6.2, I'm going to share some um, 
uh, general updates. And you'll notice something that I will say about the format of the agenda is that we've modified the format of the agenda to match and align with the format of the Economic Development Strategic Plan. So the Economic Development Strategic Plan is adopted by council, lays out certain categories. And we want to report categorically to this body as we view one of the number one missions for the Economic Development Team is to implement this plan effectively and report back to you so that as you indicated, we can measure the incomes. So that's why we've broken these categories out into business attraction, retention and expansion, entrepreneurship and small business, economic vibrancy, resiliency, and community investment so that it can align with the adopted document. So under business attraction retention, I'm just going to share a couple of updates and some things that the team has been working on. This is no, by no means everything we've been working on, uh, but staff has been working to conduct initial meetings with new businesses in the downtown area. We had one such meeting recently with Cooperage Brewing Company to walk through their new space to understand their role and how we can help to expand downtown um, or downtown vibrancy. We have been coordinating with other agencies such as the county's economic development team. I had a meeting with the airport director, uh, which was focused on strengthening partnerships so that we can understand better how the city with Visit Santa Rosa, the chamber and the airport can promote travel and tourism and how we can identify what targeted business recruitment might look like from fly to fly from markets. As you're aware, there, is now, um, uh, there are now flights from STS to Salt Lake that opens up that market, not just from travel and tourism perspective, but for potential business recruitment. And so we've been working with the airport director on what those collaborations might look like. Uh, we've been working very closely with businesses who have been impacted in the area by major closures and layoffs. Um, it is now public knowledge that Amy's Kitchen is closing their facility here. Our team has been working very closely with the Sonoma County Workforce Investment Board, also with our adjoining adjacent cities, municipalities, to help promote a job fair uh, for those workers. And that job fair will be happening on November 14th. Uh, Rafael Rivero, who is here today, will be attending that job fair, providing resources on behalf of the city of Santa Rosa for those workers. Uh, similarly, we've been looking at Wild Rhine, other companies in the area who've been affected or impacted by closures and also by layoffs. Uh, there have been multiple conversations with businesses in the downtown area about long-term planning for uh, economic development, uh, from events to what, how street closures are impacting the community, parking. We've been working very closely with our parking manager on some uh, innovative ideas and alternatives to increase traffic flow, not necessarily increase parking, but to make traffic flow, drop off, pick up, uh, temporary loading, et cetera, more easy in the downtown area. Uh, we've also been working on with collaborations on our IT department purchasing teams on implementing and acquiring the proper software that we need to bring place analytics and other data to you to this body. Um, our economic development team has been working very carefully or very closely with businesses in the ombudsman or capacity, this sort of new role that we're creating under economic development, which is a liaising role to the community to help with permitting, business licensing, et cetera. Uh, Rafael Rivero on our team has had close conversations with new businesses who are interested in the area, who are involved in lease negotiations now. Uh, I've also been involved in some direct conversations with some businesses looking for Santa Rosa, but also working with existing businesses, possibly for expansion activity as well. Um, these are some of the things that we've been working on over the last 30 days since we last met with your board. These efforts are also going to be laid out in the implementation plan. So in the implementation plan itself, as I mentioned under the uh, prior item, will include efforts related to the one-stop shop, uh, the RFP and request for proposals uh, for the establishment of that virtual one-stop online business portal is currently active and we're soliciting bids now for that, as well as the um, in-person business to business support space, which we'll be creating in the economic development office, which is in room six over at city hall. All of those things will be part of the implementation plan to help support existing businesses and, and draw new businesses to the area. Um, so that's uh, my um, update on that item, I can turn it back over to you for discussion or questions anyway.
Yeah, where's Cooper's new location? It's right across from the old press Democrat building. Um, so you've got the, which is now the collab space. Mm -hmm. And there's the, there are the two murals um, on the buildings there with the empty lot. They're adjacent to, I guess they're right across from the theater. By the comedy club? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. be right behind um, the California. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. It's on Ross Street. Street. Yeah. If I, if I may, uh, by seventy-five yeah. Ross Street. Okay. okay. Yeah. There's the exact address. Yeah. That's, 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 <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, as you mentioned, doing the one-on-one -on -one meetings with new businesses in the downtown area, uh, I assume any new business that starts in Santa Rosa, we we do an orientation or a sit down or or at least offer that. Right? No, not presently, but that's what we will be doing under the economic development implementation plan. So we offer that presently. Yeah. So if any new business wants that level of support, we yeah. will provide it. Yeah. Uh, but we're currently not proactively going out and scheduling and sitting with every single new business. But we will be putting together a new business kit. So when a new business starts in the city of Santa Rosa, they'll have access to all of the online and in-person support. That's part of the one-stop shop virtual, the one-stop shop and the virtual online portal that we're putting together. And in addition to that council member, um, we're in conversation with the Metro Chamber and the Downtown Action Organization to do exactly what you're talking about. So if it isn't right. necessarily us, right. that it's either them, one of those two agencies. Um, and we just wanna make sure that there are no duplication of efforts and um, understanding that many of, the, many of these businesses will uh, be members of one of those two organizations, uh, just making sure they do yeah. have that touch point. Yeah, I think I've mentioned this before. I've, I have a friend that started a business in Sonoma County and was looking to expand and so he looked at a couple of different cities uh, around the country, and one of them actually, even just as he was looking, brought him in, did an orientation, introduced him to other businesses that might use his services, and really just sort of made it easy. Um, and so I, that's the sort of thing that I'd be very interested in seeing Santa Rosa become known for, is like, bringing people in. Actually, along those same lines, I, as you're reading your list, I was waiting for the the liaison or outside businesses proactively. And my question to you is, if you could elaborate on what that actually looks like, and if our city manager or mayor is involved in such efforts. Yeah, happy to. So part of the economic development implementation plan, uh, once it's improved, will entail the uh, solicitation of services to conduct a comprehensive gap analysis and a leakage study uh, for the market so that we have a better understanding of what the unmet demand is. And then to tie that unmet demand to specific targeted industries. Those targeted industries uh, will then become our uh, sort of high profile targets for business attraction, but also business expansion. So if we're short on one particular industry, we do have that in the market locally, but it's just not meeting the demand. We will look at both. How can we work with that existing business to perhaps grow or expand at another location to meet that demand and or how could we attract new businesses into the market? Um, that will give us very specific by, um, I don't know if you're familiar with NAICS codes, but industries are broken down by what's called NAICS codes, uh, NAICS codes, National Association of Industrial codes or code standards. I could get you the actual breakdown of that acronym, uh, but then we will be able to target and reach out to those types of businesses specifically, and also by, um, uh, by corresponding market as well. We're gonna look at markets where there's already fly to fly from service or drivable markets where it would be easy for business owners or corporate executives to be able to come to Santa Rosa if they're not already located here. Uh, have been, um, Markeisha is, is uh, not afraid to pick up the phone and call me. She's, she's done that on a couple of occasions. And so I've talked to her about some of what the business recruitment strategies are. Uh, there will be a business recruitment plan, which will be developed as part of the implementation plan. Um, we're working very closely with uh, our real property team. I'm working with Jill. And we'll also work very closely with local area brokers uh, so that we can work in harmony with them to attract new businesses to the area. I did hear a lot of uh, 
future tense, we will and we will and we will. So it's not currently like a like a practice that we are currently engaged in. But are we are we expanding on the current efforts that we're currently doing? We're doing it on on we're doing it on um, sort of a as it comes basis right now. So there are businesses that we are talking to now who have expressed interest in the area. Um, we haven't been given authority yet to disclose who those businesses are, right. so we haven't put that in the presentation. But I imagine that they initiate the conversation. Right. Of That's us, what's us being proactive. And yeah. like, I'll use, I'll look at somebody's shoes. Um, name a brand, uh, Coach. Uh, have we actively sought out Coach, opposed to Coach seeking us out? At this time, we've been acting in responsive capacity. Okay. So when businesses reach out to us, we respond accordingly. And we have been talking with those new businesses. But this business recruitment plan, once we develop that targeted list of industries by NAICS code, then we will actually proactively be going out and talking with these businesses. We'll look at where there are opportunities to do that. There are trade shows and um, events that happen all across the country for the, every industry has one, right? So if we're targeting a manufacturer, for example, of a specific product, it's likely that that manufacturer is part of a manufacturing association that has a trade show um, or some sort of an event or a conference. And we can go to that trade show, we can meet with them, or we can just reach out to them directly at their corporate headquarters and schedule meetings. But we want to do it in a real targeted fashion, have more of a rifle approach than a shotgun approach so that we're actually tying it to what our unmet demand is and tying it to where we have inventory. Uh, I, I, we, it would be difficult to go target a certain type of industry if we don't even have a place to put them. So part of this business recruitment plan is fully understanding all of our inventory, what our inventory capacity is and our inventory potential is. So we know if we recruit this particular business or we try to expand this particular business, that there's actually a place for them to expand to or, or to relocate to. Well, and I think that's exactly why I asked the question about downtown is, uh, I don't think we talk enough about how land use policy drives economic development. Mm -hmm. And so if we're only doing that proactive outreach to businesses that are locating in downtown, where we don't have any industrial space in downtown, other than maybe Bodine, right, just occupied. Uh, and so that's a major opportunity for manufacturing or other types of businesses that we might want to attract into Santa Rosa that we're being less proactive about or not engaging with because simply because the land use designation doesn't exist in downtown. So I want us to be really cognizant of kind of those decisions that we're making as well. Um, and it sounds like once we have the plan and we have uh, – and call it the North Star of what we're trying to actually attract and then can go out and do that retention, that it'll be easier to break out of that model. Uh, but don't get me wrong, downtown's really important. It's the economic generator of the city, uh, but uh, there's missed opportunities if we're only doing it based on that. And you're right, council member. And one of the, uh, one of the specific call outs in the economic development implementation plan, which again, I hope we could, uh, we're planning to bring to you in December, um, does call out for a comprehensive review of uh, departmental policies, uh, zoning, other regulations, and, and not just at planning, but if there are other, other departments who their policies have some sort of impact, even if it's ancillary or secondary impact on businesses, we're going to be analyzing those as part of the implementation plan, and we're going to be coming to council with recommendations for potential changes to some of those policies where it makes sense to help speed business. It is in the very short period of time that I've been here, one of the things I have heard from businesses is just that there's a belief that it takes too long, uh, that's a little too cumbersome to, um, to launch a business. And so we'll be looking at all of those policies and coming back with recommendations. And it's something that Director Osborne and I have also have been talking about quite regularly is doing that. So. Yeah. And, and to your point, sir, if I may, you're absolutely correct in saying how the different needs opposed to or, or collaboration or aligned with the zoning uh, that, that's that's out there. And additionally to that, it's also the change in the culture. Uh, well, I think we've moved away from big box stores to the smaller retail stores. Mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, you know, so therefore, uh, I definitely cognizant of, of yeah. one. The general plan is also going to be coming to you guys shortly, mm -hmm. um, which would be a great opportunity to look at all of those land use designations mm -hmm. that we have forecast into the future, and then the zoning will have to be updated to implement that general plan. So to make sure that these things are happening 
together, we're aware of that as well. And, and to be really clear, I'm not saying we need more industrial land in downtown. That, that probably doesn't meet the spirit of what we want to do with the general plan, but acknowledging that there is a role within our economic development plan for focusing on some of those areas as well. Uh, we run into this a lot when we talk commercial space and repurposing commercial space for housing. There's an appropriate spot for both. Um, and mixed use is great, uh, but uh, don't want to completely push out commercial space because we're just focused on housing, right? And, and Chair, if I may, because um, I think that's an incredibly important point. We, we focus heavily on the retail side of it, and there's consultant services that we're going to be bringing in to have a very strategic retail attraction game plan. Um, and to Mr. Dare's point, um, you really have to understand what sort of desire is there for that retailer to come in. And if you don't do that analysis and that understanding, you're never going to get that retail. So I think in the past, we've said we want these businesses and we're programming that business in, but we've never taken the next step to understand, is that business really interested in getting to the market? So once we do that, then it will be this very focused certain retailers that we go after, and that will cover that piece. But then I think what that leaves behind is the other commercially zoned areas. It might be industrial, it really just is a vacant space issue. Um, and retail it is a little more predominant. We see that, and there is that downtown. But when you get in other areas where we have big industrial space, what sort of use can populate that? And how do we look at that from a policy standpoint? And I think when we go through our South Santa Rosa specific plan, there's going to be a very heavy economic development focus on that because it will potentially be looking at programming the commercial area. And it's very important how we create flexibility in that commercial area, how we can create clearances that make the streamlining of CEQA easier. So all of it is really coming together, um, but I think what our plan here is a very strategic approach, but then on the new business side is pivoting to that really quickly. We have met with new businesses, but not necessarily in an equitable fashion. And it's not, be, and it's, there's good reason for that. We don't always know when they start. So I think there's very simple things that we can do to understand when a zoning clearance comes in, flag it, put it over the economic development side, and just create that relationship. Because when we create that relationship from the start, then it's more likely that that business owner is going to come to us when they're experiencing trouble, um, not before it's too late. And that, that's what our game plan here is to really develop those relationships long term. Um, but as I said before, a lot of this, we're really building the infrastructure to be great in a year. And this first phase of the, the strap plan is really focusing on that. So you'll see a lot of these elements come out and how do we, how do we game plan for this moving forward? And then I think the nimble nature of it is we're doing a five-year plan with both month council goals. So we have to make sure that it's nimble enough to, to adapt to that need that the council may to redirect with the party on the economic development side to go after something very specific in the future. Um, so that's really what we're trying to set up. The universe that can be nimble, equitable, and make sure that we can get some of these big retailers interested in Santa Rosa. Yeah. And you know, I'm I'm not I'm not naive. I know high cost of living area probably things like manufacturing jobs are going to be harder to bring here than other low cost areas, areas. Um, but hoping for more than just more retail jobs, really want some kind of diversification, particularly for higher income uh, earning positions. And so a lot within the medical space, right? That's kind of a hub, a lot within the uh, biomechanics and, and uh, bioengineering space, like those types of positions, figuring out how to better attract them um, not just not just more retailers, which more retailers is good, but other diversification and higher income uh, positions is, is better. And last thoughts. Well, I'm, 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 I'm one of the key words is versatile or nimble. Uh, I definitely appreciate that that is part of the, the plan. And, and you're absolutely right. Retail is not going to uh, produce higher paying jobs. You know, my 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 thoughts of when I say retail, it's really the tourism especially as, as we're speaking to the San Jose airport or bringing in the outside folks and increasing our tourism is what, what's the draw? How can we get them to leave more money here? Yeah. Cool. Let's go to public comment. Yeah. Uh, just an observation in terms of, you know, your recruiting efforts or, or trying to find others that want to come here. A good source of that is some of your existing businesses, either their suppliers or their customers. It's just worth asking. Yeah, um, I, I was just thinking about this, the zoning issues and wondering if the plan addresses um, what happens at the city limit and at the urban growth boundary. And then just Santa Rosa postal addresses that are actually county. Is that something that's like 
in the plan because it's not within the city limits or is that part of the process? So I, I think I can answer for you. So because our jurisdiction is the city limits, uh, the general plan and whatnot, we can't zone land for the county yeah. that's outside of the city, but we do work in partnership. So I do remember when, for instance, we were doing our regulations around cannabis, one of the things, because we were putting in a buffer zone uh, between cannabis operators, is we did have an opportunity to reach out to supervisors in the county and ask that they respect that also, that if you had a, a facility that was right on the city's limits and we had a you know 600 foot buffer, that they would also use that buffer away from our things as well. So there's coordination. We don't have direct authority over anything outside of the city, uh, but certainly things like economics. Uh, if you have a manufacturing facility that's just outside the, the city limits, still impacts our economy. So I know we're in communication and coordination on that. Is that anything to add, Scott? Um, I apologize. Looks like what happens is the screen sharing keeps timing out. So I have to keep bringing it back up. <laughs> Uh, we, going back to the comments earlier, uh, a, a look at the policies and regulations that do exist now, in particular, uh, how those impact land use uh, will be spe specified in the implementation plan to review those and to come back to council with recommended changes. Um, as far as how that might impact um, how that might impact uses outside of sort of our core urban area as the public commenter indicated and what that might look like on the outskirts or the outside edges of the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, there is a focus on downtown and the economic development strategy as adopted by city council uh, defines that, or I wouldn't say defines, but establishes a focus on downtown. And so we will be looking specifically at downtown recruitment strategy but we will also be looking at what expansion and recruitment strategies look like throughout all the districts. Uh, and it will be part of the ongoing recommendations that we will make uh, for recruitment expansion efforts in general, and then better understanding if there are unique barriers or challenges for recruitment or expansion that are different conditionally uh, from downtown in some of those other areas throughout the districts, we can have, uh, we can adopt specified plans out on a per district level, if, if that makes sense. And so each of the districts will have different challenges, different opportunities, uh, different transportation issues, housing issues, et cetera. And so it's not necessarily gonna be uh, one glove fits all. We're gonna be looking at what's good for each of the individual districts based on land availability, land usage now, and the land uh, usage, usage potential and opportunity could be. Is there anything you want to add from a general plan standpoint around that? Just one quick clarifying point. So uh, typically before we annex an area, we go through what's referred to as a free zoning. Uh, right now we were looking at South Santa Rosa and the specific plan for that area that is now in the county. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean annexation is coming soon. This means it's the first step in that process. And what that does is it basically looks at the zoning allowances over that area it potentially can create streamlining for certain uses. Um, whereas the, it's still the, the land is in the legal jurisdiction of the county, when we incorporate it, we're setting it up correctly to basically provide the, the system we need from an economic development standpoint. Um, and if really, if you look at Santa Rosa, there really isn't a lot of industrial area. And if you're trying to focus on a very big manufacturer or big job creator, um, CEQA becomes an issue, land use becomes an issue, water and utilities become an issue. So it's very different than a retailer coming into a different space. So really those documents are critical because they can set the foundation for that annexation and eventually that business coming into the city center. All right, let's go to 6.3. Uh, so chair 6.3, we're gonna provide some updates on entrepreneurship and small business. Since we last met, our team has been engaged in conversations with our local small business development center, the SBDC, and also with our local chamber, other organizations, business support organizations uh, like the Downtown Alliance, uh, the um, two community benefit districts, Railroad Square, Courthouse Square, talking with those boards and commissions to better understand how our team may work collaboratively with them 
on initiatives related to providing small business support and also entrepreneurship support for startup businesses. As council member Alvarez, you indicated earlier, you made reference to not duplicating efforts uh, or being redundant. That's something that we're building specifically into the economic development implementation plan. Uh, we want to ensure that for a cohesive and efficient use of the city's resources, which are limited, that we're leveraging resources and braiding funds and resources where possible with these other support organizations and agencies. We're not looking to create entirely new initiative, which will take the wind out of the sails of these, of these agencies, but rather how can we support them in their efforts? And if there's something that they're not doing, uh, which is lacking or which the small business community needs, then how can the city come in and, and fill those gaps? And so those are conversations that we're having now. We're having internal strategic conversations around how staff will be allocated. Uh, their time will be allocated to these various boards and commissions for these various agencies and organizations. A lot of them you know, have their own boards so that we are better collaborating with them. It also has entailed a real close look at existing contractual relationships and what those contracts look like and the deliverables in those contracts. We do have some contracts that are actually quite old. Uh, and some of the memorialized collaboration with some of these other agencies, which have been memorialized in a contractual agreement, have deliverables or outcomes which are based on factors that, that no longer even exist today because the documents are that old. So we will be looking at updating those documents, coming back with better contracts, with more specific measurables, which actually relate to and tie to existing economic conditions. These are conversations we're having with these support agencies already. In addition to small business support agencies like the SBDC and others, we're talking with workforce support agencies. I mentioned earlier that I've already met with the Workforce Investment Board, and we're having discussions with the Workforce Investment Board around how the city and the Workforce Board can collaborate on their initiatives, talking with other organizations like the North Coast Builders Exchange, um, and um, with uh, there was one other, it will come to me, but we're talking with these various workforce organizations now to understand what their needs are and how we can potentially work together, knowing that from a business and employer perspective, workforce labor is one of the number one points of concern. Uh, when we're looking to expand an existing business in the area or support a business or, or bring a business to the area, one of the first questions often asked is, tell me about my labor force in the area. Tell me about my workers. Are they trained? Are they educated? Can they get trained? Can they get educated? And is it difficult for them to live in the area from a perspective of housing, services, et cetera? This is why we're working with these uh, organizations closely. We're also looking presently now at the spend down and uh, allocation expenditure of the remaining ARPA funds that we have, which were pre previously set aside for economic Let's development. Let's do it quick. <laughs> What's that? Let's do it quick. Yes, we know that we've got a short window. Uh, we're currently working with North Coast Builders Exchange on some, uh, we're actually trading paper right now, developing a contract on using some of those funds to support two programs that they have, uh, which provide more skills and support for new skilled workers who are, who are entering the trades and looking to enter into those markets. Uh, also, in addition to these conversations that we are having with these different workforce and business support agencies, we're continuing to liaise with small businesses in the community. The economic development implementation plan does call out for the development of an ombudsman program. Uh, it's something that we've been doing somewhat loosely already before. Our economic development specialist, Rafael Rivero, has really been leading those efforts. Uh, but again, in more of a responsive, reactionary um, on an as-needed basis and not necessarily as proactive as we'd like to see. So the plan will call out a more proactive engagement strategy for those small businesses so that we're tracking their trajectory as far as growth, if those businesses exit the market, understanding why, et cetera. Uh, so those are my main updates for um, entrepreneurship and small business. Any questions the board has? Uh, just a, a side comment, because you mentioned some of the ARPA stuff. Make sure you bring that back to council, because council has allocated the ARPA funds in a specific way. It's some of the things that you're mentioning we've never talked about before. And 
So just make sure that you are coming back to council for a discussion about it, because I'm not sure that that actually matches what council has allocated those funds for. Yeah, so uh, if I may, council yes. member, um, we are coming to the city council on December 17th with an ARPA update. Um, that's, Ryan, that's different than passing paper back and forth to enter into a program that the council's never heard about. I understand that. Yeah. Um, and I'll get with staff so I can get the specifics. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure that this month that the funding to fund what is being discussed right now is actually coming out of the ARPA pot. Oh, good. Right. Yeah. If it does, we'll be sure that we get that approval from you all. Yeah. I just want to make sure because we were very deliberate in how we spent those ARPA dollars, what we yes. were trying to fund. So any deviation from that, I would expect it comes back for approval. Well, uh, you all did give the city manager approval to move funding up to 500,000 between line items and ARPA. Correct. Um, again, I need to get the staff to, to understand the specifics of what is being discussed now, because it may be a moot point, but to your point, if we are reallocating ARPA dollars, um, we will absolutely come back before you all. Um, right, but to punctuate the point, you all came back and asked us to move it. So I want to make sure that that's happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. That's all I got on this one. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, um, um, a few things. Um, so you started out talking about entrepreneurs and small business, and then you explained what was happening on the plans with that. Um, so an entrepreneur, you know, can be anything from just starting a business as a sole proprietor, just a solo person, or a multi-million dollar thing with hundreds of employees. And a small business, I've seen many different definitions of that. Less than 100 employees, less than 15, less than 10. So, um, you know, how, what I'm wanting to ask is, how do you define it? And what are you actually doing that's different for someone who has nine employees as compared to someone who has 900 employees? What's different? I'll ask that question in just a second. Let's finish the public comments first, get all of them out. Okay. Um, it's another observation. More towards the small business touches on retention uh, and entrepreneurship also. Um, I, I rent small industrial spaces to people. So I get this on the front line because the first thing I tell them is you got to go get a business license. That's going to involve getting zoning clearance, which used to be free and now costs $500, which doesn't sit well with a lot of people. Um, but the, the bigger, that isn't going to drive anybody away. What does drive at least some of my experience away is when you get into uh, uses in, in the, uh, allowed in the industrial, in some cases in commercial districts, um, that require minor use permits or, or major use permits. But forget you, the, the majors, just looking at the minors, which the threshold is, in my mind, way too low. You're telling somebody, you know, to, to get your uh, zoning clearance and your uh, use permits that's required, that's going to be about somewhere between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars. If it's a if it's a regular conditional use permit, it's pushing twenty. Um, and it's surprising who that applies to. You know, it's not the big companies you've just been talking about recruiting and Amy's Kitchen and places like that. This is a guy who who fixes cars, who does a smog shop. Uh, you know, if you do a smog shop, that's that's a minor, or that's, that is a permitted use in most industrial areas. You pay your $500 to get your zoning clearance and your business license, you're off and running. In that same space, if you pull and change transmissions, that requires a minor use permit. Fifteen, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. That guy turns around quick. He just, it's a non-starter. And so in the course of, of what, Mr. Moon has been working on in terms of relooking at some of the things that, that are maybe impediments that get lost. Um, I'd say go down your, your, your conditional use permits, your minor use permits, and look and see what's the city gaining by actually all this scrutiny on some things that are often businesses that are just relocating from one side of the street to the other. You know, that. Um, 
I think it, in, in some cases, it has, has people you know, stay where they are or not start or just go somewhere else. But I do think it, it needs a relook. We've had somewhat of a use permit creep because it used to be quite inexpensive to get a minor use permit. And, and the other part of all this is time. So as a landlord, if somebody's going to need a minor use permit, it's probably three months. Mm -hmm. You know, am I going to hold my space empty for three months while they get one? Probably not. Wow. You know, that all ricochets and that all has a, a much bigger impact on small business than I think you, you're aware of. Yeah. I think the point's well taken. <laughs> Scott, you want to jump in on either comments and then also answer the question if you could? Yes. Yeah, so the question, if I may, was how do we define the difference between an entrepreneur or a small business is that well yeah what is the definition of those two and then what are you doing that's different with them than everybody else right so generally we ascribe to the federal definition of a small business which is established by the small business administration as being any business with under 500 employees however a small business with 499 employees or a small business with 12 employees, they have very different needs and they have very different challenges that they face in operating their business. So we can't take a one size fits all approach. Economic development is very organic. It's not necessarily binary. What computation might work for one business doesn't necessarily work for another. So we really have to triage in a sense and understand exactly what the needs are of that specific business. And whatever approach we take as an economic development team is customized to the needs of that business. One business might need workforce training. One business might need um, site location assistance. Another business might just need simple support in navigating the permitting and licensing atmosphere within the city. And so what services we deliver, how we define what sort of support, for example, small business A or small business B is going to receive is going to be driven by what that small business is asking for. And our developing programs and processes, which can be nimble enough that we can change and adapt and offer to them that customized service based on their needs. Certainly with entrepreneurs, for example, some of the services that we aim to offer and provide are going to be more specific and centric to helping those entrepreneurs with support and assistance that are more relevant to startups, what it looks like to navigate city processes, get city approvals, if they need assistance with funding or developing capital stacks or finding investors. But we're not necessarily going to offer uh, a training, for example, or an educational package for that small, that entrepreneur, if our small business development center already offers it. Uh, we would instead look to connect them with our small business development center so that they can take advantage of a program that already exists. So not duplicating or reinventing services, but understanding what the needs are of the individual business, whether it's an entrepreneur or a small business. And we understand, and it's actually very well documented and, and studied, that most, uh, most business growth and uh, worker growth does come from your small business community. Uh, it comes from those businesses who have already established themselves. They've made it that first two years, which is sort of the, the danger period for a small business. They're not quite a big business yet, but they're looking to grow. And we understand that that's where we need to place a, a lot of our efforts. And then um, through the chair, the second um, public commenter's comment uh, with regards to um, the conditional and minor use permits and circumstances or situations where maybe it doesn't make sense, uh, we're moving across the street is triggering a, a licensing event or a permitting event. We understand that there are things which have been codified, uh, whether by ordinance or, or um, otherwise, that, that have created a system where it might make sense on paper, but in practicality in that real world situation, um, there, there may be a better way to do it. And what is the city gaining uh, if we're getting a $15,000 uh, 
permanent fee, but we're losing a business that perhaps could create much more than that in revenue for the community. That goes back to the policy review uh, that we will be doing and bringing back recommendations uh, likely in aligned with the general plan update that's going to come to city council to have those discussions and to look at what those changes need to be or at least develop better mechanisms so that the city has the ability to be flexible in those circumstances rather than so rigid. Um, does that satisfactorily answer? Okay. Let's keep going to 6.4. 6.4. Uh, so for economic resiliency and vibrancy, and am I still... Yeah, sorry, it keeps, <laughs> the screen share keeps resetting. Let me go back to the screen. There we go. So staff working on a number of programs uh, or initiatives related to economic vibrancy and resiliency. I mentioned earlier that part of this entails efforts with regards to updating the art strategic plan and also looking closely at how we're doing events within the community. We continue to host a number of events within the community, both city hosted events and also working with uh, our chamber partner and other downtown partners, and, uh, DAO, Railroad Square, others on providing event support, understanding that these events are creating vibrancy in the downtown corridor. Uh, we're looking more closely at what updated protocols or procedures for some of the event planning perhaps need to be, looking at the event application itself, and working with closely with the chamber who has the blanket special permit uh, to, to permit events in the downtown area, to understand how we can also incorporate into our event planning, uh, merchanting planning and merchanting strategies as well. Uh, presently, we approve events as long as they meet the required criteria, uh, which is necessary for the event to obtain its permit, and then the event operates in, in the downtown. However, we have heard from some businesses that they feel like there's an adverse impact on them as a result of, of those events. And so incorporating uh, merchanting strategies, working with the event organizers so that they better understand how to partner with businesses in the downtown area or wherever an event may be occurring. Partnering with those businesses to do cross-marketing uh, or cross-advertising, uh, doing more event-related wayfinding signage to encourage the foot traffic that's there for the event to also go visit the businesses while they're in, the pro in that proximity while they're at the event. Uh, developing this merchanting plan also is something we're doing around and for the art community as well. Uh, there are a lot of communities who successfully do this where if there's a new sculpture that is installed in a public space that the city will help to facilitate conversations between the artists and the businesses. The businesses might have special events or services or products that relate to the sculpture so that there's really cross connectivity between what these, um, these different activities are so that the art and events and the merchants and the downtown businesses are all benefiting together. And so this, these are plans, the art merchanting plan and the event merchanting plan are two plans that we're currently developing now. Uh, in the meantime, we continue to work with and understand what some of our uh, community needs are around events, understanding what the community interests are and knowing that there are other residents beyond the immediate downtown area who have opinions as to what should be happening in the downtown and may, because of those opinions, uh, there may be factors influencing whether or not they do or do not come to downtown and understanding what those are so that our events are also um, attractive, not just to the downtown market, if you will, but uh, attractive that we have events attractive to all Santa Rosas. And so those are some of the things that we're doing. I can, um, to get more hyper-specific, a couple of cool things that I can talk about with regards to economic vibrancy. Uh, there was recently the cleanup of the uh, Polo mural on the creek uh, that happened over the weekend and members of our staff and over 20 community volunteers got together, cleaned graffiti, applied anti-graffiti coating to that mural. It was a real sort of 
fun community event. Artists were involved. These are things that we're doing to bring the community in and, and plug them into things that are happening with regards to art and art activities in the community. We also had um, a tour of Santa Rosa Public Art recently, and we had art coordinators and um, other staff from other municipalities come recently into Santa Rosa and meet with our art and culture coordinator, Mary Wilson, and walk and tour all of our art and exchange ideas with other communities around how we can create economic vibrancy and placemaking using art. Uh, so those are a couple of things that we're working on from an uh, economic vibrancy and resiliency perspective. Uh, with regards to resiliency, I can just, um, again, reiterate that the economic development implementation plan, uh, being, being malleable and being able to pivot and adapt that plan as necessary is part of how we will ensure that we maintain resiliency in all of our efforts. Uh, we don't want the economic development plan to be a plan that we just put on the shelf, nor do we want it to be a plan that... Um, regardless of what's happening in the economy or in the market that we're following too, too specifically. And so these are things that you'll see when we bring that implementation plan back to you, um, how some of those strategies are designed to create more resiliency in our efforts. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Chair. Penny? And, and other questions that you work on, I know this, this is a touchy subject, and I understand why we have our parking meters. So I've already, you know what direction I'm going in. I'm looking at our neighboring cities. I'm looking at the needs that we have to upkeep our parking garages and why we must do the things that we do as a city. And I'm, and I'm tapping into your experience in the prior places that you've worked. Uh, do they have parking meters in, in Humboldt by any chance? Um, they do in the downtown area in Eureka. It's interesting because parking is in my notes for the next item that I'm going to talk well, to then, you about. Then I'll wait, but I will, I will give you the, it's actually not so much parking downtown, but as, as, as my district grows and we're seeing that we are getting these new developments in areas that normally wouldn't have them or that now do have them and the cars that are coming with these new developments and them seeking parking spaces and they're parking outside of the, the complex itself. It, itself. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of enforcement when it comes to parking in a community that already is strapped for cash. And now we're seeing these tickets on individuals. So, but I'll save the rest of the column for, for the next time. Uh, unless you wish to answer that. I, I, I have parking on my, uh, on my list so we can Perfect. dive into that on the next item. That sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Cool. All right, we'll go to the next item then. Six five. Okay, six five. Parking. <laughs> so, uh, yes, Council Member Alvarez, some of the other uh, municipalities and jurisdictions I've been to do have parking meters or paid parking in their accounts. Uh, this is a discussion that's happening all across America. Uh, most of our cities in the United States, especially those west of the Mississippi, are designed around the car economy. Um, and parking, where to park vehicles, how to use our vehicles to get to where commodities and, and goods and services are located is how our economy has run predominantly since uh, the end of World War II. Uh, we're really seeing a, a shift or a change in how consumers are now acquiring goods. And that really is sort of the Amazon effect. We now live in a world where instead of having to drive to that store or that location, which initially, as we know, Main Street America, it was all individualized. You had your shoe store, you had your watch store, you had your office supply store, and then that evolved into the big box store where all of those goods were in under one roof to where now most of these goods and commodities, especially with younger generations, are being purchased online and delivered directly to their front door. Um, so the, our, our physical infrastructure, our streets, our commercial buildings, uh, our businesses are designed around the car. And uh, with that, we have traffic and parking systems and infrastructure, which were really designed for an economy which is 20, 30 years ago. And now we're having to understand, now that there's less driving 
or the acquisition of goods and commodities. And more of the driving is related to, uh, at least from a consumer perspective, uh, experiential retail or service retail or entertainment retail. Do our parking structures and infrastructure today, does it work for that type of use? Because a consumer who is going out to, to get a haircut or see a movie, their parking needs might be different from a consumer who's just running into the watch store to pick up a watch. And so our team has been working very closely with our parking group, our parking division. I've had a number of uh, meetings with Chad, our parking manager, and we're looking at what other cities are doing across the United States, which um, have programs that are working well with regards to parking. Uh, we know that we have several parking garages <clears throat> in the downtown area, which are owned by the city, uh, which are not fully utilized at their full capacity. We know that we have vacancy in these parking garages. So how can we better utilize these public spaces so that it creates more economic vibrancy and how are other cities doing it and, and what's working and what's not working? Uh, we were looking into cities who have developed downtown ballet programs publicly run uh, downtown ballet programs where consumers can drop off their cars, do their, you know, go get their haircut, go, go out to a restaurant with their friends and come back and, and have someone bring their vehicle to them. More, um, more uh, quick loading uh, locations, quick drop off, quick pickup locations, uh, how to encourage employees and workers of these businesses to not utilize uh, the paid parking, which is in immediate close proximity to the business. Uh, looking at even opportunities, uh, as I mentioned, the airport. When I met with the airport director, he said, boy, we're really short on parking. You have a lot of parking garages. You know, what are some things that we can do to, to make this work? So we're really looking at parking, par parking it as a whole strategically. I know that the parking manager has a presentation coming up, I believe, with the executive committee is going to be talking more about some of their findings. They just did some robust community engagement, did some surveys, reaching out to the community to better understand parking. With regards to your, your specific comment, though, um, we do understand that in communities and, and in areas in various districts where maybe there's distress, uh, or the economy needs more support because the economy may be struggling, does bringing in paid parking spaces or paid parking stalls metering, uh, what is the impact on that business? And what's the trade-off? How much are we getting in income through those parking mechanisms versus how much we could get an in income versus businesses who are performing and doing very well and paying taxes? And so that's a level of analysis that we're currently working on now. Don't have any recommendations yet, but I do anticipate that we will be coming to council with some more firm recommendations. And it's possible that we may actually come to this board first to a bit of a study session to get some of your thoughts and your ideas on some of these uh, potential parking programs and proposals before we actually take it to council for and, you to adopt. And if I may, um, as Mr. Dare has alluded to, so a lot of moving parts. You all will be getting a presentation at some point on parking from our parking manager. With that said, I do want to share some anecdotal uh, observations with the both of you all. Um, so as I interact with business owners, property owners, downtown specifically, um, it's clear to me that there isn't a consensus around parking right. downtown, right? where, again, anecdotally, half of those business owners emphatically communicate to me, don't get rid of the parking meters. We prefer the turnover. We don't want somebody sitting in a spot for eight hours, right? And in the same exact space with a different business owner, they will say, no, get rid of the parking meters. And so there isn't a consensus, at least in the downtown area, whether or not we should keep or... Um, do away with the parking meters. I will say though, when you compare us to other cities, uh, us being the largest city in Sonoma County. So when you look at the larger cities in each county, whether it be Alameda, Con Contra Costa, so on and so forth, they all have paid meters. And comparatively, ours is significantly cheaper than some of those jurisdictions. Now, at the end of the day, I will be honest, this is a policy decision. If you all direct us to get rid of the parking meters, right, then that's what we will do. Um, 
I think it's important though that we do some type of community outreach to understand, right? Are we talking 70-30 or is it more 50-50? Um, and, and so again, we'll be coming back to you all with additional information. Uh, hopefully that helps you all make an informed decision. Um, but there isn't a consensus on whether or not we should keep or do away with the meeting. I'm glad you said that because that's exactly what I was going to say is, you know, debt taxes, parking changes in Santa Rosa. Uh, they're the things that are constant. And it's important to remember the history of how we got to paid parking. And that's that merchants wanted the turnover and they wanted the enforcement. And so there are different conversations or different levels to this conversation one is, are we talking about no enforcement or are we talking about continued enforcement of a specific amount of time, which doesn't fix the tickets issue that we hear from people? Uh, and also, if you get rid of the meters and continue to enforce, where does the funding for that enforcement then come from, from other city services? And so I think really looking at it as two different distinct problems one is the problem from the business perspective of keeping people moving and not parking there for eight hours, especially employees, as you mentioned. But then the concern that we hear from people about, you know, my, my $2 meter turned into a $35 ticket because I was 10 minutes late getting back to it, right? Those are very distinct problems that run up against each other in, in, in what downtown is going to look like. And so I, I think it's wise to kind of put that out there because it does beg the question of what is downtown going to going to look like long term in either direction, right? Uh, so, including the DAO, including the Chamber of Commerce, including the business owners, but also the point that Scott made, going back to people who say that they're never in downtown, based on their perception, based on like, is that a real thing? Are they actually going to start going downtown if you eliminate parking? I don't have an answer for you because I go to downtown pretty much every day, so. And through the chair, I can add also trying to understand better our consumer demographic as well and understand how they prefer to uh, travel to downtown. And we know that there are uh, some demographics who won't even drive downtown. They'll take a Lyft or an Uber or rideshare downtown um, or they'll use a drop off. Or they used to have scooters or they used to have or they used to have scooters or their bicycle. And, and so. Um, uh, and, and we will be bringing also to you, uh, again, likely in the December meeting, an update, a report out on the trolley program and how that worked. Uh, you know, individuals who come up on the on the smart train and then use the trolley to come to downtown. So there are a lot of different ways that different types of consumers prefer to come downtown and, and understanding all of these might help us to develop some programs that we can also pilot. We can pilot programs and then measure them, measure the effectiveness and outcomes of those programs, and then decide which is the best one to implement long term. So. It's also worth noting, we do have a, um, uh, what do you call it, validation program for parking that has been completely underutilized. Most people don't, most of the businesses that I've talked to don't even know that they have access to it. So that also could be an avenue that's opened up if, if people do want to go for more around parking. Uh, and sure, if I might, yeah. and, and to that exact point there, the, the and, and this is actually what I pre appreciate about this presentation, Scott, is that we have this issue where it's 50 50 uh, at best. And the conversation that you're having with the airport about how to utilize a new space, I believe that's a conversation that I look forward to and I hope to continue is that we have an issue, but we're looking at it in different ways. We're looking at how to be intuitive or, 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 or progressive with it. Who would have ever thought that cars would outnumber horses, right? And this is where we are in our society. Uh, but I definitely appreciate the conversations that you're having outside to see what uses and what, what programs could be implemented alongside our parking uh, program. Um, but we went to downtown and I was hoping that my original comment was, I understand the issue that we have downtown. But the issue that I'm seeing in my district is residential, where, where we're having multiple families in one unit because of economic uh, capital sets. And the need for additional cars to, to suffice the needs that those additional families have. 
And that's where my focus of my comment was. I understand the focus of downtown, but again, I appreciate in that, in that comment of downtown what additionally we're looking at. So again, my comment was more in the residential areas of the new development in District 1. But again, with, with the, what I've seen your, your, your conversation that you're having in downtown, I'm actually very uh, hopeful that you're also having these conversations in the residential areas that I believe you are. Well, I can uh, say through the chair that um, my vision or my hope for how the Economic Development Division will interact with this body um, will not be just bringing, it's not just a data dump. Uh, I know today is a lot of updates, and that's because we're still building the airplane, uh, but that we can come to you and, and we will actually go through this exercise on our last item today. Uh, a lot more study sessions, a lot more interaction between the teams. We're not policymakers, we're policy implementers, uh, but to utilize this body uh, sort of as testing ground uh, for some of the programs that we do want to develop and also some of the programs that will, and recommendations we'll be taking to city council. Uh, for approval. And certainly as these types of things come up, if there are conversations that we're not having that you think we need to, uh, we can work to get those things agendized and we can have those discussions. I can add uh, to uh, round out this item, if I may, and to bring us to a conclusion on this item, you know, there are other things that we're doing with regards to community investment as a team. I did mention uh, the community-driven um, effort to clean the Pomo Creek mural. Um, we are also working very extensively with uh, our own internally with um, our own communication department, Ciro, uh, to better understand what uh, social media branding and messaging and outreach can be for some of the economic development programs that we're creating. Uh, looking at, and you'll see this in the implementation plan that will come to you next month, a lot of robust community engagement, a lot of robust surveys, uh, going out surveying the public, town hall discussions, Zoom hall discussions, uh, business to business meetings so that we really understand what it is that the needs of the community are. Uh, we want our programs and our uh, the, the actions around those programs to be community uh, driven and then with outcomes and measurables that the community understands. And um, those are things that will be driven to your body in the future. Uh, we are indicated continuing to work on other arts focused projects, uh, there are, if, if, if you haven't attended an APPC meeting or it's a public places committee meeting, um, I'd encourage you to, or we can send you the minutes from some of those meetings, but there are some interesting things that we're also talking about with that commission with regards to the Big Belly Trash Can Art Project, um, also looking at uh, what a national uh, arts program event might be for the city of Santa Rosa, also supporting other events such as Peanuts on Parade, Santa Rosa Turkey Trot, et cetera, and how we can collaborate with the chamber and, and other existing entities on those. Um, so with that, uh, any questions that you have or I can turn it back over to you for discussion. Good. Um, I just want to compliment the team. I mean, Rafael, Game, Scott, uh, your, your efforts are noted, uh, definitely being noticed in the community. And I love the conversations that are being had. Thank you. Well, Thomas? Yeah, I want to share my opinion on this. Um, I'm, I live just in the Burbank Gardens neighborhood, so uh, pretty close to downtown here. But I'm, I'm totally in favor of paid parking, parking meters. I think you should keep that. However, I think you should completely abandon parking tickets. No more tickets. Just don't enforce them. And so, um, then you have the issue of what about someone who just leaves their car there for many hours or all day or over 24 hours or whatever. So you could have like a formal um, certificate thing or formal card that the merchants would have that's made by the city that says, you know, you've been overstaying your parking limit. You're causing a problem here. Please be more considerate of something. Not threatening them that they're going to be towed or fined or whatever, just telling them that they were aware, this is hurting us, please don't do this. And that's what I do when people park in my driveway. And it always works because instead of them being mad at me and, you know, screw you, I'm going to do whatever I want, they feel like, oh, I didn't know I was causing such a problem. And so they never do it again. So I'm basically saying keep the parking meters, no tickets, and let the local merchants and managers have some formal thing that they could 
put on the windshield if someone's overstaying that would basically say, we know what you're doing, you can't do this, please be more considerate. Again, no towing, no fines. And then if it really gets you know beyond that, well then just tow. Well, it's an interesting idea, <laughs> but I've been dealing with the circular uh, argument on parking for a long time in downtown. Um, one thought that occurred to me based on what you just said is find them, but with that money, give them a card for their 30 bucks or whatever it is, and just say, this is, this is, we're taking your money. You can start using the parking garage and here's a credit to get you going on it. Because that's really what you're trying to do yeah. is get them off the street and into the garage. There, there's got to be some way that you can make an incentive out of that. And the free first hour is pretty good. But the uh, with your chronic uh, ticket getters on the street, uh, you know, maybe that's another thing to look at. Good. Good. All right, let's go on to the next one. 6.6. .6. Reestablish the checking here. 6.6, .6, want to talk a little bit about KPI tracking and um, I won't spend too much time on this, but you may recall the last meeting we brought some uh, economic indicators to this body and uh, they were generalized indicators and we asked, what are the types of key performance indicators, which I should have spelled KPI out on the um, report, but key performance indicators that your body wants to see on a regular basis. And there are certain metrics uh, with regards to unemployment, uh, housing, wage data, et cetera, which we can bring back on a regular basis, but being more specific in defined with how we are actually bringing quality measurables back and bringing measurables back that relate directly to the economic development strategic plan. So the economic development strategic plan, for example, talks about providing more business support to BIPOC owned businesses, actually reporting on metrics with regards to BIPOC owned businesses uh, and reporting on what those efforts look like and what the outcomes have been. And so as part of the economic development implementation plan, We've been analyzing and assessing what the specific KPIs need to be with regards to the economic development strategy and the council work plan that was adopted by city council. We will be developing an economic dashboard, if you will. And that dashboard will be fed by a lot of other sources, which quite frankly, it's just free data, it's online, and with an easy Google search, it's relatively easy to find. But uh, a lot of uh, data from California Employment Development Department, a lot of data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, a lot of data from the um, U.S. Bureau of um, Economic Analysis, uh, local data from our Board of Realtors with regards to you know, housing activity, transactions, et cetera, uh, will be fed into this dashboard. And we'll be able to bring this dashboard on a regular basis or report from that dashboard to you. I think it's important to have that data so that you understand where the economy is. But in addition to that, you want to understand whether your efforts uh, or the efforts of staff as we're implementing the policy, which has been created by council, if we're moving the needle, if it's having any impact. Uh, one example that we've been looking at is the website for the state's office of the small business advocate. And this is just a screenshot. They've got other data as well, but you can see from the Office of Small Business Advocate, they specifically report out on how much equity they've helped businesses to raise, how many new businesses they've helped to start, uh, how much lending capital they've been able to bring to new startup businesses and existing businesses for their projects, the number of small businesses they've helped. And you can drill down, not here, but you can drill down into some of this data on their website. So what we're developing is something very similar where we will have uh, the generalized economic data so that you just have that picture of where Santa Rosa currently sits. Um, although as we know, uh, most of that is looking backward. Uh, once, those, once that data, those data sets become measurable, then we can measure them, we can chart them out in, a, in an infographic or other format, and then we can look at them. 
but more importantly, or I shouldn't say more importantly, but just as important, working on bringing to you um, outcome reports, very specific outcome reports on the actual efficacy of what the implementation plan efforts are going to be. And that's going to be something which is going to be supported in large part by the new economic development administrative analyst role, uh, which Director Osborne referred to earlier. We've already got an offer out and we're looking to fill that role. Once that individual is on the team, we'll finally have all of the individuals on the bus. Um, all of the seats will be filled. And then we'll have an ec economic implementation plan, which then um, draft is complete, will be adopted, and then we'll have our marching ordinance we can move forward. Um, so that's something that you'll expect to see in the future on KPIs, is sort of a blend of both uh, the actual snapshot economic data, and we can continue to bring that to you. We can modify that as needed, as well as the actual outcome reports on the programs that we'll be developing in part led by the economic analyst after they're hired. I think comparables. You know, I thought a lot about the offer of what information do you want us to present. And my whole thing was you can present some numbers, but how are we doing in comparison to like cities? Yeah, and that's something that um, we can add into that, uh, into those reports and even on our dashboard. We've been looking at other dashboards and other cities who've done really well with their dashboards, uh, trying to pull from some of the best practices. Most of these dashboards, again, you, you purchase a, a software program that then goes out and it just pulls the information from all these various entities and then it just plugs it into the dashboard for you. Uh, but where we can customize that, if there are, you know, if you want to know, for example, how we're we doing compared to Windsor or Roner Park, or maybe um, another city within the state of similar size that has similar economic challenges or things that we can bring forward as well. And I think that that goes directly to the question that I asked earlier about distinguishing between broader economic uh, conditions and local economic conditions mm -hmm. that uh, exactly to that point that, you know, we lose 10 businesses but comparatively to our, our competitors, they all lost 100, right? Then we'll know that we're doing something that even in a challenging economic environment is helping. Uh, and so having those competitors, I think is really important for us to be able to kind of set those expectations. And I've had conversations also with Ethan Brown at the county, and we've talked about how can we work together because we know that they're compiling data as well at the county level. Yeah. Uh, and how can we work together so that we're utilizing or leveraging that data so that we understand how we're doing, how we're performing with comparison to, to our peers. Um, and and there will be challenges that we'll work through as we go along the way, because sometimes you're comparing apples to oranges. Uh, if one community has more job growth than another, it doesn't necessarily mean that that community is doing something better, but there could be some other underlying factor or input that's causing that. And then we can look at what those are and be more hyper-specific on those. Um, Thank you. Through the chair, I think what's been challenging when we're comparing ourselves to others is what exactly are we comparing, right? So we'll often hear Santa Rosa gets compared to Petaluma. Santa Rosa gets compared to Hillsburg. But when you get into the weeds, at times, those are apples to oranges comparisons, right? Um, and in the same respect, well, if we just go look at cities in California that are between 150,000 and 200,000 people, well, maybe what's going on in their local jurisdiction, to your point, Chair, uh, their local economy is, is very different. And so, what I've been trying to figure out, and I could use you all as guidance is, when we are comparing ourselves to others, what's most important to you all? Is it is that our neighbors in Sonoma and Marin counties, understanding that at some level we are going to be apple to orange because we're 180,000 people and none of them are? Um, or is it a combination of both? Right. Um, often, I, I struggle sometimes when we get compared to Petaluma because their economy is different given their one cent sales tax. Um, I struggle at times when we get compared to Healdsburg and the free parking because Healdsburg is not Santa Rosa. Right. And so, um, what I'm asking is what makes the most sense?
to you all so we can make sure we build that into the comparators. Yeah, and I think I think percentages help ease that a little bit, a little right? Bit. Yes. Uh, that, that, you know, some cities are going to be so small that, you know, losing one business is going to show a bigger blip than in others, right? But so putting the data within context, always going to be the challenge with data is how you put it within context. But I think some of it's a percentage. Some of it I think is shared aspects, right? Like we're the county seat. We're the largest uh, employer, one of the largest employers. Looking at other places that are similarly located, uh, they're the county seat, they're the focus of economic development. How are they doing? How are their vacancy rates doing? Um, what's unemployment look like? I think those are key indicators that I'd be interested in because then if we do see that there's a, a location that's doing better, we can ask why, right? It's, 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 not, it's not a you know, shame Santa Rosa. It's a where can we steal good ideas from, right? Like what's the what's the uh, what's the old saying? Like uh, good politicians borrow ideas, great politicians steal them, right? <laughs> like let's find the places that are doing good that we can learn from, right. um, just to bolster and strengthen our own uh, economic conditions. But I think having those comparators for a number of purposes, but then being able to tell the story of it when we have these conversations in committee, I think makes a, a big difference. Putting it up on a dashboard and just looking at the numbers side by side isn't going to be as helpful. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. And I think for myself, using the analogy of the apples and oranges, if you look at the apples and oranges and also you see a mango show up, pay attention to why that mango shows up. Yes. Maybe, maybe a papaya. A papaya. <laughs> yes. <laughs> An apple, avocado, avocado. Avocado. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't have anything else for the board. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to comment. Um, oh, wow. it, it seems to me that um, if you want to compare to other cities, then you need to use the same indicators that they use. If you want to compare. How are we doing? Are we better than we were in the past? Um, you could create your own indicators. But, and, and with economics, you know, it's, you got numbers, so that's usually pretty valid, but not always. And so uh, um, I'm just, uh, you know, concerned about how you define what your indicators are and you know what's the period of time and yeah. percentage, median. There's a lot of options and you can twist the story either way. And just to give you a, a quick example, um, I just recently was kind of testing out how people feel about crime and safety in my neighborhood. And so I asked people two questions. One, do you feel safe walking around the neighborhood? And two, have you ever personally been the victim of a crime in our neighborhood in the last two years? So. One's just an emotional reaction. The other is a factual incident. And their answers are completely different, you know? So um, I just, uh, if, I just had a, a lot of personal experience professionally designing questions and measuring things. And I know how easy it is to have something that depends how you interpret it and what's that mean and it's a little bit ambivalent. And others are like, okay, here's, here's a fact. Last year we were at this number, this year we're at this number. So I think you just described the Tuesday election. Uh, <laughs> how people feel versus the data. Yeah. But the point's well taken, right? Yeah. Do so. Do so. <laughs> yep. <laughs> cool. All right, let's bring it back. Anything to add, Scott? I don't have anything to add on this point now, sure. Right. Let's go to 6.7. Okay, under 6.7. Uh, so for 6.7, we're going to talk a little bit about the pop-up program, which already came to council. And so staff have been involved in engaging discussions concerning the next steps for the pop-up program. This is the vacant parcels reactivation program, wherein uh, we would help to support and allow for temporary uses to pop up, if you will, into currently underutilized vacant spaces, whether those are private, uh, in privately owned buildings or in public spaces or public buildings. 
And so when we presented on this to council, we laid out sort of uh, what next steps would be over the following three quarters. For the end of 2024, for this quarter, we're really in the initial phases of developing the framework and having conducting pre-meetings with other department staff to understand what this program could look like in beginning some just real preliminary outreach into the community. I can tell you that this concept hit the press Democrat. As you know, we've already been getting calls from community members who've said my organization or my entity or my group would be very interested in this. Uh, whether it's, you know, pop-up concerts and spaces or art galleries or actual merchanting type activities. Uh, so one thing that we would like to do is begin to better understand from this body's perspective uh, what some ideas and insights might be with regards to how this program could operate. And what I'm proposing, and I've listed on the screen a number of various questions uh, concerning the program structure and the focus, outreach and engagement, how this will work from a policy perspective, how the city will market, promote this program, how we will evaluate its success, and how we will integrate it with the one-stop shop, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, staff would like to um, send this out as a survey, if you will, to other decision makers and leaders within the organization within the city, which could also include this body, and then collect and analyze the responses, and then bring that back in December and have a sort of roll the sleeves session to start developing the actual policy framework around it. Um, and then I, unfortunately, the questions are really hard to read on the screen. Uh, but the questions that we would send out in this survey would be with regards to whether or not to target specific types of businesses or industries or activities that should be prioritized, um, how to fill vacancies, working with local entrepreneurs, targeting and identifying private spaces. Do we want to start as a pilot and just start with one or two or three private spaces? Community organizations who should be key partners to work with what considerations from a policy perspective with regards to zoning requirements and permitting flexibility. So these are the types of questions that we want to send out and then come back in December and have a longer study session when also your colleague, uh, council member of Krepke is not at Disneyland and then can contribute as well. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I, uh, I really like the, the pop-up program. I also like thinking about it as a mobile incubator uh, an opportunity for people to see, even on a small scale, whether their business works. Uh, and especially if you partner it with property managers who are looking to fill out the space, right? Maybe there's a business that they can't locate there or won't start for three months. And so you even tell, you know, a small mom and pop, like, hey, you've got two months to be able to try this out, see if you could actually make it work. And then you have to move because this other person's coming in. I, I, I like that idea. Um, so we've talked about incubator spaces for businesses and it's more of a challenge, but it's, this seems like it could be a win-win if we partner the ideas. And we've seen it on, uh, I you can actually speak to this one. The incubator program is something that we've had in yeah. This is so, um, specifically Mitote, um, and we've seen what it can do for our community, how many of those individuals have gone outside <laughs> and, and built a storefront area, Acta Mexicano being one of them. Um, for myself, I think what my concern would be if we are competing against the storefronts in the in the localized area, I'd be very cautious of that, making sure that they are prioritized or at least their needs are being met if if we are going to be competing against them with, with the people that we invite to the pop-up. Um, other than that, I think it's a great idea. And the, the incubator ideology or strategy is absolutely imperative to knowing if my business is going to work or not. And it's much easier to lose uh, 2,000 opposed to 200,000. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it really makes a difference. Yeah, and through the chair, if I may, council member, you're, you're correct in the way that we're designing this program. Uh, a consumer can go to a car dealer and test drive a car mm -hmm. and determine whether or not that car is actually the right car for them. Absolutely. Um, however, it's not really that easy for an entrepreneur to test drive a business concept until after they've spent thousands of dollars and gone through permitting and licensing, et cetera. So the idea of this program is to help make that uh, that 
try it till you like it or till you buy it process a lot more easier for businesses. But also, um, uh, so one to your point, over oversaturation within the market, we're, we're, we're considering this and how that could be um, uh, factored into a program like this. Uh, we certainly wouldn't want to allow for 20 pop-up uh, retailers of one particular type if it's going to then put the brick and mortar retailer of that same type uh, under some sort of duress because now suddenly their market share um, has been impacted substantially because there are now 20 new direct competitors in the market, right? So we're, we'll be looking at, at what that um, those impacts would be and how we can consider that into the framework. But then also non-merchant, non-business uses as well. Pop-ups could also be, uh, yeah. it could be art, could be music, could be play areas, could be play areas sports, et cetera. And so looking at, looking yeah, at all those in talent show. My talent show on the Coral Square and all the different <laughs> variety. I mean, that'd be, yeah. Uh, when I was mayor, I threatened to do a city council meeting on Courthouse Square, and Mary Keisha told me she quit. <laughs> <laughs>
not lost that initial capital and not try all costs. That's in fact, and I'm hoping that I gave you because I need more information on that 12 or 12 month temporary use permit. I would love to Absolutely. get more information about that. Absolutely. And even to the example, maybe somebody decides that changing transmissions isn't for them, but they want to do this model instead. Right. right? Absolutely. <laughs> Save that $12,000. That's right. <laughs> the unforeseen. Oh, let's go to public comment. Oh. Uh, yeah, I like the uh, idea that you guys about the talent show downtown. That would be great. Um, <laughs> He'd be in I, it. I, I, <laughs> with respect to the pop, I, I'd say you need to set it up to where uh, even the temporary use permit is not cheap. Uh, but you need to have some kind of quick and easy uh, approval process where somebody's only going to be there like three months to test it out. It's the risk of the city's minimal. It'll never be a restaurant or food service because that just isn't going to happen. But it'll be, you know, your guy selling mangoes. It'll, it'll be somebody that, you know, maybe he's making dresses in her house and wants to try it, retails, test the theory. Perfect for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and it, it makes having a rotating bunch of retailers or whatever that is is an exciting thing because you want to go see what's new. That's right. Yep. In terms of my to that point, we, we speak of how culture is changing our and our buying habits of always going online. And what we're speaking about today is exactly the opposite of that. We're actually the reason to leave your home and come to the store to see a completely different yeah. Uh, operator. It's about the experience. The experience, the destination. I hear millennials love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have any matters held in committee? No matters held in committee, sir. All right, how about a department report? Just a quick department report. I just want to share that as the team is working on developing this implementation plan, we're working to identify and understand what our own vision is, what our purpose is as a team, uh, and what our is and really, as we've discussed, um, our team vision is to help the city and the council to um, fulfill its principles of innovation, sustainability, and inclusivity in the economy, and to implement the programs and policies necessary to achieve business growth, create vibrancy and resiliency, and community investment and to help the community and the businesses to realize this vision and its goals through the implementation of the strategic plan and the implementation plan, which will accompany it. So that will really be our guiding document. And uh, we're excited to get the team completely filled, uh, get this plan green lit, and then we will have all of the folks on the bus who need to be there and we'll have our destination dialed in ready to go. So very excited. Um, and that would conclude the presentation that we have today from staff. Anything to add? You know, as I, as I think about the economy and, and how our residents feel about how we were doing in the same situation, uh, we might not have gladiators and, and tigers in the Coliseum, but nonetheless, you can gauge how a society feels about how it's doing economically, about how much entertainment and how happy they are while living in that city. And I think what we're doing is creating uh, vibrancy, entertainment, a strong economy, bringing in business. And I, and I believe that full package is what I'm seeing amongst that bus as we're gonna be driving it, hopefully until the wheels fall off. But uh, I, I like the direction that we're heading. Uh, and I will say, uh, I think that there's always, you know, over a couple of years, we have elections that are a check-in with our community. And I think uh, last Tuesday, the public, Entrusted in us passing EE and FF as well, which to me is an indicator that we are moving in the right direction. That the community is supportive of some of the efforts that we're making, uh, particularly around budgeting. Uh, but there's the implied economic impacts of that as well. So I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that and, and thank the public for their show of support uh, and uh, hearing these conversations, understanding how we're going to better utilize those resources so that they're additive. Uh, but then cause exponential growth as well uh, through our economic development plans. Let's go to public comment one last time. You good? Thanks for letting the two 
So people from the public sit in on your staff meeting. Of course, <laughs> every time. <laughs> but that will go ahead and turn. Thank you, everybody. That is it. It's so much. Well, so, uh, 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 so, yeah, so, 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 so,